Hey, how you doing? Good uh, Good evening. Thank you for joining the One Accord Bible Study tonight. And uh, we're going to wait for some people to sign on live and we'll get started. And uh, we appreciate you guys joining us. So if you would, please comment. Let us know where you're watching from. And uh, we love to see different places we're reaching. And share this video. There'll be something on here that will uh, definitely help somebody in your news feed, I promise you. And we want to talk to you today about... Um, I think we're going to be dealing with salvation somewhat, and uh, but before we get started, I just want to say I'm glad to have my two friends here, my brothers in Christ, Keith Wren and Ben Coleman. How you doing? Good evening, everyone. And uh, if you got your Bibles, turn to John, the third chapter. That's what we'll, we'll be starting at, John, the third chapter. And um, so uh, let's just dig right into the Word. Again, before we, but before we get started real quick, if you would, let us know where you're watching from. Just comment what town you're in. And, and share this video. Every time you share this video, it helps put it back in the news feed and somebody will see this. God will make sure whoever needs to see it will see it. And um, any questions? Yeah. If you have any questions, <clears throat> feel free to post them. Ben's going to be monitoring um, the live, and that's why we call this an interactive Bible study. We want your questions. We want your input. And so uh, he'll be looking, and uh, if you have any questions, then we'd love to, to uh, try to answer them. If we can't answer them, we'll... we'll uh, We'll pray about it, and we'll try to come back later with an answer. But we're going to be dealing with salvation and the blood of Christ. And my question for you tonight is, do you know without a shadow of a doubt that you are saved? Do you know it? You know, I think there's a lot of people that are on the church roll that can't really answer that truthfully and say, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I'm saved. They may say, well, I know I was baptized, or I know I prayed a prayer. But deep down in their heart of hearts, I think there's a lot of people that just wonder, am I truly saved? Am I really saved? And that's that's a miserable place to be. I was there. I know what that feels like. And uh, God wants you to have that assurance. And so we want to make sure that you have that assurance. If you're watching this tonight, we want to make sure that you, by God's word, you can know without a shadow of a doubt. The title of this Bible study tonight is the most expensive word in the Bible. The most expensive word in the Bible. And you'll find that in John 3.16. In John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now the most expensive word in the Bible is the word so. For God so loved the world. Think about that. He so loved the world. He so loved David Pate. He so loved Tom Smith. He so loved Jennifer. He so loved... Uh, Lord, Lord, he he so he he loves whoever you are, Loran. He he loves you with an everlasting love, and that caused him to give everything he had. The, the most precious thing he had was Jesus Christ. Mm. So let's dig into it. Let's dig into it. Y'all got anything you want to say? Yeah. How much did it cost him? That's the next part of the verse. It's, it's the most expensive word in the Bible. The most costly word in the Bible. What did it cost him? And we can talk for everybody. Yeah, right. um, what did what did Jesus leave behind? What did Jesus leave behind to come as a lowly baby in a manger? Yeah. And just imagine if he would have never, because he didn't have to. Just imagine if he didn't go to the cross and died, where would we be? Yeah. I mean, eternal damnation, and that that should scare somebody. Salvation is um, the most precious thing in the world, but it's also, I think, one of the most misunderstood. I think a lot of people try to complicate salvation. They try to make it about works or about um, things you have to do. See, Jesus already done everything on the cross. Yeah, that's right. And when he was on the cross, right before he died, he before he gave up his he gave up the ghost and died. He, nobody killed him. He gave up his life. He said, it is finished. And what that meant was he had finished everything that needs to be done for you and I, for us to be saved. Mm -hmm. And so my, my prayer is tonight, while we're, and we're kind of just going through this, not blindly, but kind of just following the Holy Spirit through this. I pray that somebody watching tonight, there is somebody watching tonight, that your question in your salvation, your question in the love of God for you, and my prayer is by the end of the night, you will know without a shadow of doubt how much God loves you yeah. and that you're saved. 
if you're not saved that you will be. Um, when we talk about salvation, let's talk about what Jesus had to say about it. Don't you think that's where we need to start? Yeah, start. yeah. we'll start with, with what Jesus has to say. We'll go back to John, the third chapter, in verse 1. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. He goes on to say, I want to read one more verse. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but can't tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Now Jesus was talking to a very religious man, a good, phenomenal church member. This man was a member of the Sanhedrin, the royal Jewish court. He knew the, the, the Mosaic law in and out. He knew everything he needed to know to be presentable as a representative of, of, uh, of uh, the, the Jews. And so as far as religion, and he fasted, he prayed, he did everything he was supposed to do. And Jesus told this guy, this guy that was like what we would say would be a great deacon, or even a, a great preacher, something you know. He he knows the word. He knew he knew the Old Testament. He knew it. He said, Nicodemus, unless you be born again, you can't come into the kingdom of God. You can't see it. Why would he say that, Pete? Well, that blew Nicodemus's mind. <laughs> Obviously, it blows our mind. Born again, and that's the first question. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking in the flesh, if I'm in the flesh, do I need to enter my mother's belly again? Obviously. No, that's crazy. So if we're thinking flesh, that's impossible. But if we're reborn in, in the spirit, our spirit is reborn. Our spirit is, and he, he just talks about the wind. You don't understand the wind, but you see it, you feel it, you see the effects of it. Same thing with the Holy Spirit. What a what an awesome service. At, at, if you have a, a wonderful spirit-led service at church, when the Holy Spirit shows up, you can't see him, but you can feel him, you can hear it, you can listen to him, you can see the effect of him. Amen. Amen. You know, you can you can sometimes, like you said, you can't see him, but you can see the effect. You can see it move him move through the crowd. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can see people like raising their hand, you can see like it's like a wind it's like the wind blowing through it. Yeah. And does the wind have power? Does the wind can be very calming and cool like right now i wish we had a little wind here it's kind of warm outside a little wind would be great but you then you see a hurricane the power of a hurricane yeah and what there's no more power than the holy spirit um, Amen. taking over a man i see him take over a man's life who basically denounced jesus his whole life and through planting seeds and water and seeds the holy spirit changed him from the inside out to where now he's a he's a Christ follower and he got saved it's the same thing what he's what Jesus told Nicodemus um, man can't do that man doesn't have the power to change another man's heart that's the Holy yeah. Spirit it's a, it's something supernatural that happens that you really can't explain you can try and explain it but you cannot explain I mean look what look what happened to Paul look at what he was doing that's to a, what he became example. that is a fantastic example of what God can do. <clears throat> you know, I was I was pastoring a church. Uh, well, I really wasn't pastoring. I was the interim pastor, and I was just filling in. And um, there was this um, lady. She wanted me to go to the hospital and see her dad. He was dying, and just pray with him. She said, he, you know, he's saved and everything. I went to see him, and he, I'll never forget it. He was watching wrestling. He just had the wrestling on. He was really into it. Eighty, I think, eighty-two or eighty-three years old, and. Uh, I just was kind of sitting there with him talking and he was just really into wrestling and I, I you know, it's kind of awkward. And then out of a blue, I just started feeling that I need to ask him, are you saved? Even though she had told me he was saved and I just had that feeling and I looked at him and I, 
I said, sir, I want to ask you a question. Now, are you saved? And he looked dead at me and he says, I don't think so. And his daughter's mouth just dropped. Mm -hmm. And and there and I, I just kind of took me back. And I said, do you want to be? He said, absolutely. And we prayed right there and he got saved. And like I said, he was dying. The doctors told him he was he didn't have long to live. He ended up getting better and lived ex almost exactly a year from that day. And I had the privilege of, of telling this testimony at his wow. funeral. Awesome. Yeah. So don't take for granted that everybody is saved just because they go to church. This guy went to church, he's a good man, but uh, you must be born again. And that's something the Holy Spirit does in somebody's heart. You can't save yourself, and you can't save your, your family and your friends. The Holy Spirit does the work, but we can carry the message of the cross, the gospel. Now, before you can get saved, you gotta know you're lost. And what does Jesus have to say about people that are without Christ? He said, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus considers them lost. Lost, separated from God. He also told the Pharisees at one time, he said, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of him. And I think, Keith, you mentioned while we go about the heart. You know, Salvation is a heart change. It's, it's not a head. It's not in your head. It's in your heart. We we just got back from youth camp, and our pastor um, talked about that. Um, a head knowledge of Jesus, he gave a great example. It's just like a head knowledge of Michael Jordan. All right, we're in North Carolina. Most of us, if you like sports, you know that Michael Jordan went to Laney High School. He went to. Um, you know, UNC, he's a Tar Heel, won national championship. Then he went on to the Chicago Bulls. He, was a, uh, he got a repeat, three-peat, okay? We know a lot about Michael Jordan. But if Michael Jordan was to walk right there, and I said, hey, Mike, he would say, who are you? Mm -hmm. Why? Because I don't have a relationship with him. I've never talked to him. I've never, uh, he's not my Lord. I, I've never done what he told me to do, so. That's the difference in having a head knowledge. You know who has a head knowledge of Jesus? Satan. Satan knows all about Jesus. Mm, that's powerful. That's good. Satan knows. Yeah. I mean, he spent time with him face to face. He yeah. knew who Jesus was. Yeah. But the, the thing is, what did Satan do about it? Satan tried to take him down, obviously. Satan tried to kill him. He, he did. Um, which Jesus allowed that, obviously. But um, the difference is, Satan didn't follow Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus, didn't love Jesus, didn't obey Jesus. And so all that goes into it, have a relationship with somebody. It reminds me when Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. That's huge. Yeah, a lot of people love say they love Jesus, but they don't do what the Bible says. They don't do what he tells us to do. And his commandments are, at the beginning, of that, from, that, from the a big picture, his commandments are a lot, like, I can't do this. There's a lot of rules and regulations, and I can't have fun. But in reality, it's the further that can't be further from the truth. Because like a good parent, you want to put guardrails around your kids, protecting them from all evil, from yeah. being any unsafe thing. So he he gives us rules uh, or uh, commandments because he loves us. If he wants to keep us safe, he loves us. He does. He loves us. So much that he he give everything. He so loved us, so loved us. <laughs> yeah. Jesus was in Mark chapter seven. He says, "For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, and adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and the evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. It's a heart problem." And so, one of the reasons we have so many people on the church roll that are lost, and, and a lot of people will say, believe this, and, and I know it to be true myself, I really believe there's a, a lot of people, it's because they've never had a heart change. They have a head knowledge, as, as Keith was talking about, like, you know, they, they know about Jesus, they know about what he's done, but they've never had that relationship. Maybe, maybe you're like that tonight, maybe you've never had that personal encounter with God, you just have a head knowledge. There, I've seen a lot of people, 
um, through the years that were very religious, very dedicated to their church, very dedicated to, to the service. Every time the service there was a service, they were there. But you know, in their life, their personal life, they didn't have a lot of fruit in their life. They didn't, have, they didn't appear to really have anything going on in regards to carrying anything outside the four walls. And my question is for you, Ben, do you, do you think somebody that's saved, truly born again, would they have a desire to share the gospel or, sh or share their testimony outside the church? Absolutely. Absolutely. You have the desire to step out of your comfort zone and to spread the gospel and to be a witness for Christ. Absolutely. That's something before I was saved, it would have never crossed my mind because I like being in my own personal bubble space. But God will get you out of your comfort zone. But he is there with you the entire time. He will never leave you nor forsake you. What do you think? That's another part of being in a relationship. Um, you want to tell others about it. Yeah. yeah. Teaching our youth on Wednesday nights. Yeah, uh, look at what he's done for me. Why do you want to tell them that? I mean, why, do you, why would you want to tell somebody about Jesus? Really? If somebody watching that's not saved, someone, well, why would you want to do that? I'll what tell you why. You feel okay. It's just like winning the lottery. If I won the lottery, <laughs> I wouldn't keep it from you. I tell you, would you? Dave, would you share it? With you? I'll share it. Okay. Yes, yes. I would. Y'all remember that? I tell you, I tell you, truck up with gas. <laughs> but a huge, if, if something that big in your life happens, you want to tell it. You want to tell it. And uh, there's nothing bigger than being saved from a, a eternity in hell. Amen. And if we're not sharing that, I, I, I don't think we're being as fruitful as we should be. Um, do you think it's every Christian's um, duty to share the gospel? I do because of Matthew 28. Um, we're to go and make disciples. Jesus specifically told us to make disciples. And how can you make disciples if you're, they don't know why you're doing what you're doing? Amen. Now, some people are better speakers than us. I am a terrible speaker. Um, some people are great speakers. But we have a way of just creating relationships with people. Um, and just tell them one-on-one. -on -one. Some people are better at big crowds, telling big crowds. Yep. Uh, there's some preachers that are really good at big crowds but struggle one-on-one. -on -one. Yep. My wife can talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one better than she can a big crowd. So um, I think God gives us all different talents and we use them for him he'll give it, he'll show us that need to where we tell others about Jesus. And I think another thing you might if I had something on that point is when you look at your everybody's got a background, everybody's got a history. I have a dark one that he's delivered me from. That I didn't think was possible to be delivered from. Because I tried and I tried and tried on my own. But I found out real quick I cannot do it on my own. If he's able to take that away from a supernatural experience, why wouldn't I want to go tell somebody that is going through something similar, look, what God did to me, he can do the same thing for you. That should get you pumped up. He's right. You know, I was sitting when I asked you that, I was thinking, when I when I got born again, it was such a, a love that I, I the experience I had was, and, it, and everybody's, different now. I'm not, you don't have to have the same experiences, but you, one thing that you will have in common when you come into an encounter with the living God, you'll know it. Mm -hmm. it, it won't be like, well, I think I got it. I hope I got it. No, you'll know when, when you get saved. I, and here's why I can say that. Just what you said in Matthew 28. How in the world can you go and tell anybody about Jesus if you don't even know what you got? That's right. It's, it's, exactly right. it's crazy. You cannot I mean, make it up. And you, I mean, you've got to know that you got salvation. Yeah. And uh, if not, then you're you feel like a hypocrite or fake, which in essence you would be if, if you're trying to reach people with gospel, but you're truly not born again. But when I was saved, there was a, a love, and that love was so intense that I felt love for for you. I felt love for I felt love for others. Now I'm I'm not a loving type person. That may shock both of you. I know y'all probably think I'm very in touch with my sense of sight, <laughs> but. I fell in love with people, with their soul, to the point where I would cry for, for lost souls. Yes. And that love mm -hmm. is what made me want to share the gospel. Not because I love them per se, but because I could feel God's love in me for them. That's right. And it was the, a love for him and a love for them. 
And um, you, you can't you can't fake that. This love is crazy. <laughs> How Jesus put his he he died for somebody else who hated him. What if that happened to me today? And if, before I was saved, somebody hates on me. I mean, I was a child when I was saved. I was seven. Somebody hates hated on me. I'm hating them right back. Yeah. Only the love of Jesus can turn that around to love your enemy. And it's still hard today. We know that. Um, to love somebody who fits in your face. That's right. Um, but only through his power. Only through his power can we turn around and love him. Amen. And God God uses that stuff. God uses showing an enemy love. He uses it. It blows my mind. You know, how often, you know, when you were talking about instead of loving the person for themselves, start looking at the soul. That changes everything. And the way I look at it, and I know you guys think the same way, is you know, if we're doing a revival or if I'm in a church service or wherever and I see somebody that has not come to the altar, but I see them somewhere and they're struggling just mentally, you just physically, you can see on their face that they're struggling. And if I don't go to that person and be a witness to them and talk to them and pray for them and I let them walk out that door knowing that 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 could be the last time mm. that was their last chance to get salvation from them because there's no guarantee for the next hour. And if I let them walk out that door, then I have failed them. I mean, how many times do we ask people at the altar, and it, it blows my mind, um, and I'll ask a simple question, what's your relationship with Jesus Christ? How's your relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, let me ask you this. If you were to die tonight, would you go to heaven or hell? It's a simple question. Well, I think, you've already answered my question, you would know without a shadow of a doubt if you've been reborn again. I think, I think that's something worth really harping on is, Knowing without a shadow of a doubt that you're born again, especially in in, in in these times, we're in dark times, the end times, and there's so much hopelessness and, and and all this doom and gloom that people are looking for something. They're looking for something real and tangible. And when they see people that are professing to be Christians that are just as as doom and gloom and and, and with no hope, it really it really is it's really a bad witness. And so I think that because it's so dark in this world this is a great opportunity for us to shine at the light of God you know it's and Jesus when he came he, he didn't come uh, to bring world peace he came to take us out of this world he come to he come to give us his peace and it's not our job to try to create a utopia on earth and have world peace our job is to is a rescue mission. That's right. Amen. It is to reach people with the gospel, and, and 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 they have the hope of Christ, the hope of glory, Christ in them. Um, Keith, why why did Jesus have to die for us? It, it, we we know salvation is because we're lost, and but but why did he have to die? So it goes all the way back to the garden, the Garden of Eden. Uh, that's where sin entered the world. For the first time, um, Satan tricked Eve and then Adam, and sin is now entered into the world now. So all of us are born into sin, and without the cover of the coverage of blood and forgiveness of those sins, we are doomed. We are actually damned to hell um, because sin does something very bad, and that is separates us from God. God is so holy, God is so powerful, so perfect, that we can't be in his presence with sin in our life. So that's where Jesus comes in. Praise the Lord. Um, God left a perfect throne to come down as a, a little baby like we talked about um, who would one day eventually grow up and die and take our place. That's the, the bottom line. Is he took our place. And and once we accept that fact that he he died for us, um, and by the way, he didn't stay dead. Uh, he came back to life. He defeated hell in the grave so we wouldn't have to. And all we got to do is accept that fact and make him Lord of our life and ask for the forgiveness of our sin and give it all to him. Just give everything to him. You're saved. That's, that's how you get saved. And I ain't, I ain't trying to put nobody on the spot, but I, I want to... 
I want to talk on this, the simplicity of it. Why did he have to die and shed blood? Why, why blood? So, in the Old Testament, the sacrifices had to be brought to the temple to as an atonement for the sins of the people. Like a, an animal or something. An animal, an animal sacrifice. Okay. Um, and God wanted the best. He didn't want to you know, bring your, your worst looking sheep. Mm -hmm. He wanted your best. And so, thankfully, we don't have to continue to do that because Jesus did that for us on the cross. That, that his blood covers our sins. Just like way back in the Old Testament, the blood of that animal would cover our sins. Amen. You know, they, they, uh, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, there's two cherubim there. And on that mercy seat, the priest would go in to that Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle blood on the mercy seat one time a year. Yeah. And they would tie a bell to his leg and a rope. Because if he went into the Holy of Holies, in the temple, I think there was three sections. I know the, the, the section where the Ark of the Covenant was, which is where God dwelled, where they, they come to dwell, he come down to dwell. It was so holy that his priest had to be completely consecrated before he could go in. And if he went in and wasn't, he would die. And one time a year, he'd sprinkle that blood that you're talking about. And in that Ark of the Covenant was the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. the law. And so the law really was not given to us to, to save us. It was it was really given so we could see we needed a Savior. Because we can't keep the law. Mm -hmm. uh, you may think, well, I've kept all the commandments. You may think, you, you may say, I've never... I've never murdered anybody, you know. I've never, I never still stole anything. But you know, you, we murder people with your mouth, with gossip. You steal things. There's a lot of ways people can steal. But the Bible says, if you're guilty of one, you're guilty, guilty of all. all. Yep. And so, and how many sins separate you from God? I want to take the one first. That's yeah. right. That's right. Well, the blood. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, Jesus said in Matthew 26. He said, and he took the cup and gave thanks. This is when he was doing the um, uh, last supper. He gave it to them saying, drink ye of it, for this is my blood in the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sin. So what, right there he's saying that his blood had to be shed for forgiveness of your sins, our sins, right? Hebrews 9.22 says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. That's what Keith was talking about. And without the shedding of blood is no remission, there's no forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 2, 1, 7 says, And whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. You know, Christianity has been called a bloody religion. You know, but the blood is, is, is everything. The, the precious, holy right. blood of the Lamb of God, a spotless lamb without blemish, Jesus Christ. His blood, holy and pure. Um, Set, it, it completely not only forgives our sins, but is as if we have never sinned in God's eyes. Y'all right. need to get that. You know, if I have wronged Keith or Ben, I'm sure they forgive me at some point and say, you know, we still be friends. But they're always going to remember, yeah, forget it. man, he, he, he cut my throat or whatever, right? God doesn't do that. When he forgives you, it's as if you've never sinned. He forgives we got to remember what Jim talked about a while ago was Saul's conversion. <clears throat> um, he changed Saul into Paul. Saul was a murderer. All, his sole, sole existence was to persecute Christians, to get rid of Christians, yeah. to pound out Christianity, Amen. And all Christ's followers, until he had the experience on the road to Damascus, until he was saved. He had an experience with God. And God used him and... God didn't count all of, all of his past against him. Can you can we say amen to that? Amen. He didn't count his past against him. And I know there's people watching or listening or will listen later that think I have done this or I have I haven't always been the best at this. Well, I'm pretty sure you didn't kill any Christians. If you did, you probably didn't kill as many as Paul. I mean Saul, excuse me, Saul. And what did the Lord use Paul to write half the New Testament? Yeah. Um, it blows my mind. It is amazing. That is amazing. That's the picture of forgiveness. 
picture of, of, of a life turned upside down. And when, when he turns your life upside down, you won't want to do those old sins that kept you from God's presence. And uh, Revelation 1 5 says, To him, Christ, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Yeah, Jesus, when, or the Father sees the blood of Christ applied to our hearts, he doesn't see all these other things I've done in my past. Praise the Lord. Amen. Because I have a lot. You know, you know, I was I was thinking about um, Kennedy, the, the guy that's talking about running for the Democrat, uh, Robert Kennedy, Jr. Uh, a junior, third, I can't remember. Anyway, I was watching an interview, and he said, well, I got a lot of skeletons in my closet. You know, this guy, I would say this about him. He, he, just, he comes off being real genuine and just straightforward. But it got me thinking, we all have skeletons in our closet. And, mm -hmm. you know, if I was to run for office, oh, my Lord, there'd be skeletons coming out left and right. But the way I would handle that, and I'm not running for office, but if I, the way I would handle that, or handle that when people bring up my past, is I say, you're right. Yeah. I did do that. I did more than that. You don't know, but I did worse than that. But God. But God. God, God so loved. Yeah. Because they say it like, well, who, man, you should. You sure you should be preaching? I'm like, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I can tell you, I've been in the, I've been in the pit, man, where, where the, the bad stuff is, and I know what he can do. He can use anybody, anywhere, anytime. If you'll surrender to him. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Mm -hmm. Bottom line. And he's come to set the captive free. That's right. And we're not given a spirit of fear. In bondage, we're supposed to be uh, free and have liberty. And a lot of Christians walk around in, in fear, guilt, and unforgiveness. Um, That's straight from Satan himself. Absolutely. That is not... From God. And it's not even forgiveness for each for others, it's for themselves. A lot of people can't forgive themselves, man. You know, we persecute ourselves. A newsflash, we're all hypocrites. So and only by the blood of Jesus and blood of Jesus alone are we saved. Are we free, free indeed. So maybe you're watching tonight and you're you don't you haven't forgiven yourself. Maybe you've had an abortion or you've had an affair. Um Maybe you wronged somebody or hurt somebody really bad, and maybe maybe you've talked to them and 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 you've you've made it right, but inside you've never truly forgiven yourself. You got to do that now. You got to ask forgiveness. You you got to give yourself forgiveness because God, when He shed His blood, it was for all sin. It wasn't just for you know the lie, a little white lie. It was for the 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 most awful scene. Matter of fact, they're talking about sex trafficking now a lot because of the mm. movie that's come out, um, yeah. uh, Sound of Freedom. So, you know, even people like that that are involved in that, they could be born again. They could come out of it if they would repent. Now, there is a point to where you can't be saved. Uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That's a whole nother... Yeah, that's... Uh, He's trying to give you a gift of salvation, and I'm not. Yeah. I'm, I'm not taking that. that that's blessing the Holy Spirit. It's like telling you no. Rejection of Jesus. Rejection. Yeah, rejection. So the blood. Yes, no, you're good. Go the, the blood should be preached more and talked about more um, than it is because it. That's that's where it's at. Jesus Christ had to shed His precious holy blood for us to have redemption. The Bible says in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things into himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. So that blood paid it all. You're bought with a price. You know, when you're saved, you don't belong to yourself. You belong to God. You're bought with a price. Revelation 5, 9 says, For you were slain and have redeemed us to, by God, your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And you know, salvation is, is a, an, an experience. It's not um, it's not a, me a method. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's, it's not methodical. It's not a cookie-cutter thing. It, <clears throat> it's an experience with God. And, and, and what brings that experience is a convicting power of the Holy Ghost. 
the Holy Spirit grabbed your heart, even at seven years old. You're seven years old when you got mm-hmm. saved, right? Mm-hmm. Even at, what have you done at seven years old? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, what dropped your sippy cup or something? I mean, really, what he, what could he have done at seven <laughs> years old? But God had a, re, a purpose to save him at seven, and look, kids can get saved a lot easier than adults because they don't have all this junk in their head. They believe. Jesus said, the, the kingdom of heaven is like this little child. He was talking to the disciples. They're like, hey, I want to be, who's going to be greatest in the kingdom of God? He says, okay, I'll show you. And he, he brought this child. He said, this, this is what you have to be to come into the kingdom of heaven. Childlike faith. Seven years old. How in the world did you get saved at seven years old? Right. Praise the Lord. A loving family who taught Amen. me that you were born into sin. It doesn't. If you're seven years old, you're a sinner. If you're six years old, you're a sinner. You're born into sin. Day one. Um, we're not. We don't learn to be selfish. We're born selfish and lying too. We're born yep. lying. We're born to cry to get my way mm-hmm. before we can talk. If I cry, my mama feeds me. We're born into that. And so, my mom led me to a believing faith in Jesus Christ, and now it's taken some time to grow that relationship with Jesus. It's not, um, you know, you study His Word, and you, you learn more about Him every day. Mm-hmm. You know, Billy Graham continued to learn about Jesus mm-hmm. until his death, right? And now he's seeing him face to face. So, um, once, once we realize that we're a sinner, that we need Jesus, um, make Him Lord of our life, and and ask him to forgive us of our sin. If seven-year-olds can sin, um, I don't know many seven-year-old murderers, but um, that's what we were talking about a while ago. He can save you from the little white lie. He can save you from the rape. He can save you from the yep. murder, the divorce, whatever is out there. Um, and I, we talked about this last week too at, at, church, at youth camp. Is, um, folks with a, a big testimony of being brought out of the pits of hell, out of, uh, of addiction, out of uh, sexual immorality, all the, the what we call big sin. Uh, those are miracles. It's, a, it's the same miracle as saving from somebody who's never done that kind yep. of stuff. Right, the testimony is, he saved me from hell. He, he was a, that word right there, redemption in Romans 5. He redeemed me. You know, that's powerful because what that says, it's not about your righteousness. That is, that is everything. It's his righteousness. So even though Keith, at seven years old, hadn't done what an 18-year-old wild person like I was, or even 20 in my 20s, really, um, it didn't matter. You still need a Savior. That's right. Mm. And still need it today. The key is, I think we talk about if I know I'm saved. How do I know I'm saved? Well, yeah. Scripture tells us we know them, we know about their fruit. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what fruits are we showing? Um, the fruits, the, the fruits of the spirit. You know, first print, I mean, uh, the first print is thirteen. Talks about love. Do I show love ever in my life? I know some people who, good church going people. I've I don't know if they love anything. <laughs> They're always mad. Uh-oh. The first, uh, if my first response to every situation is anger, I gotta need to deal with that. Um, so I don't want to go keep too going. Personal, keep going. Too yeah. personal there, but well, good. Um, I don't yeah. Go. Well, no, no. By fruits, are we? Do we show fruits? What, what, what did Jesus fruits? do to that fig tree that wasn't bearing figs? He cursed it. He cursed it to death. That was, and we're cursed to death. If we don't have a relationship with Jesus and He don't see our fruits. The fruits. I want to read that to you. Because uh, Galatians 5. This is the fruits of the Spirit. It says uh, Galatians 5 in verse uh, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the first one. First one. Why? Why would that be? Because that is God is love. You can't, man. If you say you're saved and you don't love, you're full of it. We're full of it. 
I mean, really. I heard when you say that. I'm sorry. It's the truth. Yeah, you you can't say you're saved and and not love. You mean I gotta love somebody who hates me? You gotta love people you don't even know. That's right. You gotta love that. Who's your neighbor? You yeah. gotta love. Mm, love. Joy. How many people do you see that don't have any joy? That's huge. For I see a lot of Christians. Um, I won't say older Christians, but I've been saved a long time. Have lost their joy. They're like bitter because we we forget who we are. Yep. We forget who saved us. Forget where we come from. Forget who we came from. Where we came from. Yep. That's our joy. Our joy is is Jesus. What he did for us. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, you're good. You, the, 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 go ahead. I think that's one of my constant reminders every day um, is never forget where I came from. Never forget where I came from. And it's hard. I understand that it's hard. People have gone through painful situations. I recently lost my dad. Painful. Uh, he was my hero. Um, Amen, saw him go from Mr. All World, uh, from into the sporting world, the church world. He, uh, he turned into a, a great spiritual leader, to uh, I would say a vegetable, but almost could not be able to take care of himself. That's hard. It is, man. And people have been through worse stuff than that. And so if we deal with just the painful part and just live on just the painful part, you can see why folks lose their joy. Yeah. But the issue is, I know my dad is not suffering right now. Amen. Um, he is staring at the Father. He's uh, walking the streets of gold right now. And that's joyful. That's extremely joyful. Now, he's not with me, but I know he's where he is. Um, I know I'll see him again one day. And that's, when we talk about joy, I, I want to just remind people where you came from. If you've lost your joy as a Christian, go back to the beginning. Uh, like we talked about from the, be the beginning of this tonight. Go back to Genesis, where we came. We came, we're born sinners, doomed to hell. That should give us joy that we're saved from that. Amen. Yeah, joy, joy is something you can't get from the world either. That's only from God. Yeah, you can't get joy from fame, materialism. That's, you might you could be happy, but true joy can only comes from God. That's right, and that's eternity. Everything in this world is temporary. Everything. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. That peace goes into non-peaceful situations. Yep. Mm. Okay, we have um, situations at work where we could lose this contract. I might lose my job. I might lose my wife. I might lose my whatever. We have a peace that, that passes all understanding. In the, in, the, in the flesh, I try to understand everything. I can't, his ways are way higher than our ways. But we can't understand all the, the ways he gives us peace. What's the opposite of peace? That's right. Violence. Uh, yeah. I, I think, when I think, I think of fear. Yeah. Fear robs your peace. Does it not? Right. And who gives us fear? It ain't God. Because he says he hasn't given us the spirit of fear. Okay. So <clears throat> fear will rob your peace. And I, I want I can speak of on that. I mean personally, it's I battled with this spirit of fear that every now and then it would come by to see me. And literally it's it's literally like somebody coming by the house to, to, to attack. Um, I can be going good for a while and all of a sudden this wave of fear will come and, and it's really don't make any sense because you say, man, what? I don't really have anything to be fearful of, and, but it's a it's a feeling, it's an anxiety. Yes. And I got the same thing. And it's a, it's a spirit, is what it is. It's an attack, and it's come to rob my joy, my peace, and um, I. You have to address those things. You can't just ignore it. My wife will tell me sometimes she'll say, you need to cast it out. You need to tell Jesus. You know, I'll be ignoring. I'll be like just miserable, like. You need to you need to tell it to hit the road, yeah. you know? because if you don't, it just you'll stay like you're living. It, you know? Yeah, you don't change. Prime yeah. example uh, when we went up to Asbury. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So peace, long suffering, man. Ooh. Nobody wants to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> long suffering, uh, gentleness, goodness, faith. Gentleness goes strictly against. Our nature. 
nature of the man. Yep. Uh, we should be hard on everybody. We should pound people into submission that are not like us. Yep. That's not being gentle. That's not God's gentleness. But can a man be, can you be manly and be gentle? Jesus was. Exactly. You know, Jesus was not some hippie with flowers in his hair driving a Volkswagen around singing Kumbaya. <laughs> he was a man's man. Jesus went into the temple and whipped them and cast, turned the tables over. I'm talking about a rough, living in the woods man. That's my Jesus. That's right. I don't have a CC Jesus. That's I just right. don't. And I believe... We don't want to get sidetracked, but there's an attack on masculinity anyway in our country. Okay. You know, um, and and gosh, I'm gonna get probably get off here, but I, I got to go here. Have y'all noticed that you don't see any women trying to become men as much as you see men trying to become women with this trans stuff? It, it seems like every time you turn around, it's a man wanting to look like a woman and dress up like a woman, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason for all of it, but it's it's against nature. It's against what God wants want, you know credits to be, but it's a perversion. And um, what's your thoughts on it? I know well, it goes straight to Sodom and Gomorrah. This is not new. No, uh -uh. the trans world is not new. Um, gays, uh, homosexuality is not new. It's all the way back in the scripture in Sodom and Gomorrah. And I want to. Please, if, we, if any of our watchers are confused about this topic, just go straight to the Word. Don't trust what we say. Amen. Go straight to the Word and read how God felt about the folks in Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, it is black and white. There's no gray area. God made us the way He made us. He made us in His image. So we don't have to change that image. Go back to Solomon Gomorrah. It's, it, it's not very black and white. Which, which I know it kind of got off a little bit, but it carries us back to the get fruits of the Spirit, which says faith, meekness, meekness. Uh, if Glenn McKeithen's watching, um, me and him were talking one time about being meek, and we said, well, not like us. That would be the definition of meekness, not like me and him. Cause me, being meek is something that eludes me a lot of times. Humility, which I, I'm embarrassed to say that, but I, I think the more I confess it and ask God to help me with it, the more. But I think God matched us up with women, perfect wives, with, <laughs> yeah. with, with, with yeah. a meekness that matches up with yeah. our non meekness. But it's uh, meekness is, is power under control, I think, right? Power under control, yeah. And then you got temperance, against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh. Listen, salvation. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections of the lust. So, um, when you're talking about the fruits of the Spirit. So we know that uh, salvation is for the lost. We know that the blood of Christ has to be shed for us to be have forgiveness of our sins. And... Uh, we know that Jesus died in my place, in your place. Okay. I, hope, I hope we don't forget that. Um, I hope we don't forget where we should be, where we should be headed, and who we who we were before he saved us, and who we are now. I'm child of the King. Amen. That guy comes with uh, some great benefits. And he rose again. He didn't stay in the grave. Praise the Lord. Are you sure you're saved? Hmm. Has anybody got any questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, if you don't mind. No. Uh, earlier before, there was a topic about um, going out being a witness to Christ. Um, Judy Adams said, or asked, what do you do when a loved one won't let you talk about the Lord and Jesus <clears throat> because they are so bitter about life? They can't say anything about what Jesus did for you. So I can just tell my story. Bingo. I tell my story about what he did for me. That's what the that's what the gospel did. 
That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John did. They wrote down what they saw, what was happening at the time. And I, don't, I think folks can get bitter about what happened to me. Well, and you can, you can, Judy can live it too. Like, I, there's also the time when you feel like if you tell your story, they may have heard your story and, they're, and they still are not reacting to, you know, your testimony. Yeah. But being consistent and living before them, not judgmental and not arrogantly, but humbly living your testimony. Just being faithful to Jesus. Being faithful. And don't give up. Don't give up on them. No. Um, that's giving up on someone who says they don't want to hear the gospel. Um, that is limiting the power of the gospel. Um, he's able to save to the <clears throat> He's able to save even the guy. I mean, the thief on the cross. Today he did it in, in paradise. I mean, he saved him. And, um, so he can save even the like I, I was talking about earlier. The, the most bitter person who wants to fight everything God has for him, the power of the blood can save that person too. Absolutely. You, you can't, it is not your fault that their hearts are so hardened or whatever the reason that they don't want to hear it. Um, but as long as you're continuing to reach out to them, then everything is good. I'll tell you something else, Judy. If you'll if you fast and pray for them without them knowing it, um, and fast how you feel led of God, but just commit yourself to pray and fast for them, yeah. for their soul to be saved, and, and just watch God work. And uh, so is that. Yeah, I want to encourage you. Don't give up, Judy. Don't give up. I've seen people um, have to pray for 20 years for their spouse to be saved. And they got saved. That's right. Amen. You can't force them through that door. You can only open that door. They have to walk through that door. And that's nothing to feel guilty about at all. You're being obedient and you're being faithful to Christ. You got another question? Connie Wood asked, Do you think God would put an evil spirit into someone like he did Saul in 1 Samuel? getting deep. <laughs> um, I'll have to go back in context and, and look at that with Saul in context, but I can tell you off the cuff, no, God's not going to put an evil spirit in anybody. However, God has is sovereign and has all power. And, and, and I think sometimes we try to make excuses for God and say, well, God not going to do this and God's not going to do that but to not do it but allow it to happen is the same thing in a way and there's things God allows to happen and we say well God wouldn't let nothing bad happen to me well he allows things to happen all the time so I, I'm, I'm going to put it this way because I have to dig on that I, I've never searched that out I've heard that but I've never researched that Connie but I'll say this um, I've learned that I don't know his ways his, they're higher than mine and there's things that God in the Old Testament done that blows my mind uh, he, he would tell my wife out complete whole you know families and everything and that don't sit well with a lot of people but it's, he, you know God's holy and perfect and whatever he's wanted done if they would have obeyed and done what he said that would have been fine but because they disobeyed God they suffered the consequence so, you got anything you want to say on that? Well, I'm, David was the king, not Saul. You know? Yeah. David was God's king. That's right. Not Saul. So, yeah, I, I think that would take more research on him. Yeah. I never asked that question either. Yeah, that kind of put us on the spot there, Connie. But, but he uh, does allow things to happen for a reason. He allows certain things to happen in your life for a reason. Whether we can't see the good from it or not, he allows things to happen. That's that's hard to understand. It is. In the moment. Mm -hmm. so how many testimonies could you see like? God took me out of that situation and now look where he has me. Well, it's just like get back to salvation. You know why I got saved? Because I about lost my mind. Mm -hmm. It's not because I went, I love Jesus. I didn't, yeah. I got saved because I, I was going to hell. I, right. Right oh my God. Yes. He, I was losing my mind. I was losing everything. 
And uh, when I started losing my mind, literally, it got the the weight got so heavy, I was about to lose it. And I knew I was on my way to hell. I didn't get saved because I wanted to be a good person. I got saved because God, the Holy Ghost, let all hell come on me, or, or what I could endure, I was, so to speak. So what made me think about that was I felt like it was so unfair what God was doing to me. When I was going through that conviction, I couldn't pray. I, I remember we were at a, the house we had bought. I was on the steps of this house, and I, Beverly would find me on the steps crying. I'd be on the steps crying, asking God to save me. And this went on for, for weeks, and I'd just be a mess. And he would not hear my prayers. He was like his hand was in my face. I, I, I felt like I was about to be praying to the wall. Bad stuff was happening. I had an evil spirit taunting me, all kind of thing. And I was like, this ain't fair. Why would God do this to me? What kind of God does this to me? It got that bad. But once you say that, and once you think that, where do you go from there? Who are you going to report God to? Who are you going to go complain about? Who are you going to complain on God about? You know, who, 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 who can straighten him out? That's right. So I finally got to the point where I realized he's the final authority. He's in control. Not David Pate, not what I think's right, not what I think's fair. And that was the beginning of the surrender process that it takes to come to Christ. When you realize it's not yes. what I want, it's what he demands. That's right. He demands all men everywhere repent. And sometimes, you know, in our instances that sometimes you have to hit, this is what happened to me. You have to hit your rock bottom. Yeah. To the point where you just want to quit or die in order to find him. Some people have to come to that point. Others don't have to. He arrests you. Yes, he does. You 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 don't want God. You don't you don't get up one day and go, Hey, I want to be a Christian. I think I'll do the right thing. That's 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 bull. What happens is Jesus chooses you. He through his spirit. The Holy Spirit arrests you, even at seven years old. Even at 82 years the spirit of God draws us we can't take credit for anything you can't take credit that that hey I decided to get saved no, you can. the no. spirit of God draws no, you yeah but man wants to take some kind of credit well you know I I made a decision I decided I'd do the right thing no you didn't you were facing hell you were facing judgment you were facing your sins the wrath of God and you said you know what I want to be forgiven I want God to save me. It wasn't that you thought, well, I'm going to do God a favor. And I think a lot of people today with these false salvations, is they, it's almost like they've done God a favor. Well, God's a good God. He does really good things. I'm blessed. I, you know what? I'm going to live my life for him. No, uh -uh. that's not salvation. Salvation, it comes through repentance, which is brought on by the Spirit of God who draws you to the cross and lets you see yourself as you really are and you realize, I'm lost and undone. I need a, I need a Savior. I need that precious holy blood of Jesus Christ to Amen. cover my sins or I'm going to bust hell wide open. That's what's missing in a lot of people's lives today. And that's why a lot of people don't have a true conversion. Like, and I'm not trying to label everybody, but I'm just... And what you, what you do is surrender. That's it, man. Surrender. That's Everything. I'm not I'm not defeating this sin. You're not I'm not quitting it. I'm not overcoming this sin. I'm surrendering my life so he can overcome this thing. This thing that separates me from God. That's the bottom line. It's all through his blood. Which boils down back to what we were talking about before, the heart. It's gotta be a heart change. It's gotta be a heart change. I got more quick. Uh, no, there's only two questions I got for you. Is there any on there? Y'all got some questions folks, because we're getting ready to get off here. But before we get off, and, and if you got any questions, please put them on there. If we can't answer them on live, we'll answer them later. Um, how can you be assured that you can keep your salvation? That's a big divide right there. That's a denominational divide right there. It, 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 it's disgusting. It's disgusting how divided the body of Christ is with denominations. It's disgusting because if we rightly divide the word of truth in context and we don't try to label and compartmentalize everything, 
it's not that hard, folks. It's not hard to figure out. And I don't, I'm certainly not a scholar, but I can look at the Word of God and see that there is apostasy, the apostate church. But I also can see that I can't lose my salvation. There's no way I can lose my salvation. If you could, my, my understanding and my uh, understanding of God's Word is if I could lose salvation, I'm limiting God's power. Now oh, you're saying your sin is greater than, right. than the blood we were talking about. Right. You know, it's only, only fresh blood. Mm. Yeah. How many times can you be saved? I've had people ask me, uh, you know, they say, do you believe you can lose your salvation? I say, well, how many times can you be saved? How many times can you be saved? Is there a limit? What are you saved from? Are you saved from your sins? That's not what you're saved from, did y'all You're not saved from, you're saved from the wrath of God. God's wrath abides on the wicked. So when God saves you, he doesn't say, Ben Coleman, I've jerked you out of the darkness into the light and you're born again. Good luck. I hope you make it to heaven. Yeah. If yeah. you don't, I tried. How silly is that? You know, help me realize, I grew up in a church that believed, they taught you can lose your salvation. That's what I grew up in all my life. All my life. One day you're saved, one day you're lost. One day you're saved, one day you're lost. And I, I believe that. That's the way I was brought up. You know, they, we were free will Baptists, and that free will was you have the free will, you can lose your salvation. That's not even what free will means when you go and research why the free will Baptists started. It was, it was, um, it went all the way back to uh, Calvinism and all that stuff that you have a free will to accept salvation. Anyway, what I'm trying to get at is somebody out there tonight, you need to know God will save you and God will keep you saved. He doesn't save you hoping that you make it. He saves you so that you will. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus when you're born again. And it's just like my child I, 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 running toward the highway at five years old or seven years old, as Keith was talking about, seven years old, running toward the highway, and I go and grab him and say, son, that highway is very dangerous. You'll die if you go on that highway. Okay, I'm sorry, Dad. I'm not going to go back in the house right. and forget he's out there in the front yard because if he's got my jeans in him at seven years old, he's still going to run to the highway. <laughs> so I'm going to make him not go. Y'all want to help me out? I'm kind of getting them off here. I think Where? the whole point of once saved, always saved, but that doesn't, that's, that's not, not in the Bible, by the way. That's that not. term. Right, that's right. We need to address that. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, know where you know, <laughs> I know where you're going, but that's, a lot of people say that. If we're, the goal is, is to continue to work on that, to walk with Jesus. Amen. And making him more of our life. And my question is to you all, and I know we're trying to close. Um, anybody online, um, if you're not born again, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, which you can get right now, is it worth, is whatever you're doing, whatever you're holding on to, is it worth you turning off your computer or this phone or whatever you're doing, going to bed tonight, knowing that this could be your last chance, what I talked about before, and not giving your life to Christ? Is anything in this world worth your salvation, worth your relationship with Jesus Christ? That is my serious question to you all right now watching. Keith made a comment. Once saved, always saved. And I, I agree. You can't lose your salvation. But that term, once saved, always saved, is, is something people try to, to uh, <clears throat> argue over. But when you're saved, you're truly born again. You can't be unborn. Right. Right. That's right. That's right. You can't be unborn. The Bible says, Jesus said in John 10, and I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. What? They'll yeah. never perish? Yeah. Does that really mean, did he really mean what he said? If you lose your salvation, that wouldn't be that. So he really meant never, didn't he? Never. Never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. I had a man tell me one time he was trying to, like I said, I believe when I grew up that I was taught, you know, in our church you could lose your salvation. And then I, I went to defend that point. 
I went to defend it in an argument with a guy that says, uh, you can't lose it. And I was like, yeah, you can. So I started digging in the Bible. I was going to confront him. Well, the more I dug, the more, the more. Come across that right there. Yeah, and it convicted me. I was like, Jesus, I'm saved by faith. Jesus is the author and finisher of my faith. I'm sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. No man can pluck me out of his hand. Including me. Yeah. And I thought, what liberty, what freedom, what joy that my salvation is not dependent on me. Hold on to that unchanging yeah. hand. Say, he holds on to me, thank God. Amen. Amen. Well, that's, that's where we get all the food. That's where we get our peace from. Yeah, amen. That's how our, our long suffering comes into effect. That's how our, all the rest of the food is here. And that love is, is all based on love. Connie Wood has a, another excellent question. Is this a tough one? No. <laughs> <laughs> so if you get saved and backslide, if you die or Jesus comes back during this time, are you lost? The Bible says God is married to the backslider. And I'll put it this way. If your child runs off and does something wrong, are you just going to abandon your child and say, well, that's not my child anymore? Is he not your child anymore? Yeah. There's no way right. he's, he's your child. When you're exactly. born again, you're born into the kingdom of God. Now, I believe and this is a whole other subject, and we're going to get off of here. But there, the Bible speaks of a sin unto death. There's a sin unto death. And I think that people that are truly born again, if they backslide and rebel on God, that God will take them out. At some point, God will just take them home. He'll, he'll just take them out before he lets them become a stumbling block for others. And I, I've had a preacher, me and him, talking about this a while back, and it was a really deep discussion. But you're here to be a witness. And if you're rebelling against the Holy Spirit of God, you can get to a point where I really, like I said, I think God will just take you, take you on. Uh, see, your soul is precious. It's not about, it's not a game. It's not a, uh, well, if they do good, I'm going to keep them. Jesus died for, for, for our souls to be saved. So there's nothing we can do to keep our salvation. There's nothing we can do to justify our salvation. But when we're truly saved, we will follow him. And we will want to please him. And the more you want to please him, the less you backslide. Yeah. That's, I know that's obvious, but. I've backslid before. I have. I, I, I have. Times. I've backslid. And it's when I walk away from I walk away, not he walk away from me. That's right. I walk away. Great question, Connie. I mean, it really was. Cause I, um, when I was preaching, and God called me to preach, uh, I've been divorced. Um, now, in God's eyes, I'm not. In God's eyes, I'm forgiven. I'm born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. When I married Beverly, I was lost. I got born again after I was with her. So everything I've done, it, it, whatever it is, is gone, son of the blood. But these these people that I was preaching at their church, they, they held that against me. And they said, well, we don't. They had an emergency meeting on me when I was preaching their church. And I made a comment. And I said, you know, I, I appreciate y'all letting me preach here because I feel like God's calling me to preach. Well, because I said I was wanting to preach, they had an emergency meeting later and told me told that I couldn't come back because I'd been divorced and all this. It's just silly. But anyway, I got mad. I got mad with God because I felt like I'd been put in a, a embarrassing situation. It was already a sore spot for me anyway because I grew up in in our church. If you've ever been divorced, just hey, pay your tithes and go home. You can't do anything for God. Yes. You're done. It's an unpardonable sin. That's a lie from yeah. Satan. Too. Well, that's that's the way it was. Yeah. Long story short, I got mad. I said, I'm out. I'm not going to preach anymore. I'm done. And I went and bought me a 12-pack of beer and went to a party. And this is after I was preaching. And I found all my buddies. I found out where they were at. I went to that party. And you could have dropped me off in, in the sedan somewhere in, in Africa. And I wouldn't have been in a more unknown spot. I felt like I was with strangers. People I grew up with, I felt like I was naked. Like, just, it was just the most yes. horrific feeling in the world. So bad that I left. I just left. I, I, I wasn't the same with the person. I didn't have the same relationships with them. I, I'm different. I, God, I'm a new person. Right. Therefore, for any man being Christ, he's a new, new creature. creature. He was set apart. So what did God do? Did he say, well, David, you disappointed me. You backslid. No. Nah. He knew the day he saved me that I was going to do that. That's right. He still saved me. And he knew I'd sit here one night and tell you about it. <laughs> He's a loving God. And he loves you. And right now, 
as, as, my, as my brother said a while ago, what's more important than your eternal soul? What's more important than having that peace that keeps the country? Now, what is more important? Nothing. If you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior tonight, or whenever you're watching this video, the Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His name is Jesus. Right where you're at, whether you're in your car, you're at home, you're at work, say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you died on a cross for me. I believe your blood was shed to cover my sins. I believe you died in my place and rose again the third day. And I want to receive you as my Savior. And by faith, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. It's a commitment from your heart that you speak with your mouth. And if you've made that commitment tonight to Jesus Christ, to receive him as your personal Savior, I want you to type in, I am just one. Type in, I am just one. And the reason we ask you to do that is it makes it public. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, if you be ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you when you come before my Father and the Holy Angels. It's nothing Amen. to be ashamed of. I am just one. I received Jesus Christ. They are celebrating in heaven when you receive Christ. Secondly, we'll see it and we'll message you and send you a package with a free Bible and some literature in it to help you get started on your Christian walk. Maybe you're saved tonight, but you've never made a public profession. Maybe you've been a closet Christian. Now's your chance. Type in I am just one. Let, let, the, let the world know that you receive Jesus Christ. We'll message you. You can say, hey, I'm a Christian. I just want to put that in there to make a public profession. But you do that. Christians that are watching, you backslid. You haven't been where you should be with God. You haven't lived the way you should live at work and in public. 1 John 1, 9 says that you confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Right now, you say, Lord Jesus, I, I fell back. I backslid. Please forgive me. I confess my sins. You confess it to him. He'll cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. And then you rededicate your life tonight. You recommit your faith. And the way you do that is you type in right now, I am just one coming home. I am just one coming home. And when you put that coming home part on there, we'll know you're saved, but you're just recommitting your faith. You're recommitting your faith to God. Why would we do this? Why would we give this invitation? Because we're in the last days, in the end times, and your soul is precious. And we want to make sure that everybody that watches this video has the opportunity to receive Christ, be born again, or recommit themselves to Him because He's about to come back for His church. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. the Lord. Any, all hearts clear? Yes, sir. Hearts I want to clear. thank Brother Ben Coleman and thank Keith you. Wren. Yes. Thank you, brother. I want to thank you guys for being with us. This is, this is, we, this is fun. Really we, we enjoy it. Yeah. God is good. Amen. Let's Amen. pray. Absolutely. Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, your blessings tonight, God. Yes, we thank Lord. you for thank the you. questions. And, Lord, we, we pray for those that uh, lift up Judy's request, Lord, for her, her lost loved ones, her family, Lord. I pray yes. for strong conviction on their heart. Yes, God, I pray Lord. they would be saved, gloriously yes. saved, God. And, Lord, we lift up to you all the ones that's watching tonight. Yes. Lord, those that are lost, we pray for great conviction on their heart. Those that are saved, Lord, we pray for them to be just encouraged to go out tomorrow and live for you. God, we thank you for all you do for us, Lord. We praise your holy name. Let the words of our mouth, the meditation of our hearts, be accepted in thy sight. O oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you all. Amen. amen. Have a good evening.